wasn't here to give uh, the, uh, the talk um, on the first day of the conference, but better late than never. Okay, I'm not sure that this talk really belongs in the ESP conference. I was sort of racking my, my brains to think of could I slant it in some way to be an ESP, but I think that would uh, be cheating, so I won't try to do that. Um, the reason why I want to talk about um, Asian primary schools and teaching in English in Asian primary schools, in particular task space, is because I think this is one of the really big issues in, um, in Asia today, because so many countries have uh, begun to introduce uh, English in primary schools. Here is an outline of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about how English has been introduced into a number of different Asian countries. And then I'm going to talk about task-based language teaching, and this is as some of you may know, what I have written quite a lot about, and I'm still writing a lot about. Uh, I then want to talk about problems with implementing TBLT in school context, because there are many problems, and this will then lead me into the fourth uh, part of my talk, which is the importance of teacher education. Uh, I don't really think that there's much chance in TBLT being introduced successfully into Asian primary schools unless there is a well thought out uh, policy for teacher education. And then some quick conclusions. So first of all, introduction to English in Asian primary schools. Uh, this is China, and this just summarizes the position that exists in China. Uh, English has been introduced into English primary schools, at least at the level of policy, although if you read articles uh, relating to the success of this introduction in China, you very rapidly realize that there are uh, many schools, in fact, where uh, nominally English has been introduced, but de facto it hasn't really. This is Korea, and one of the interesting things about Korea is that uh, I think this still exists, that the Ministry of Education in Korea has stipulated that primary school English teachers should practice uh, an English-only policy. In other words, uh, they should not use Korean uh, when they are teaching English in an English lesson. This is actually a very controversial issue, and I'll come back to that particular issue uh, a little later. This is Japan. Japan is always a little bit behind other Asian countries, and this is certainly the case with regard to English. Uh, you can see what's happening here, and it's not until 2020 that uh, English is actually going to become uh, part of the official curriculum, uh, a mandated part of the curriculum, and actually assessed uh, as a subject in the primary school curriculum. Uh, Malaysia. Malaysia, of course, is very different because English has a different status in Malaysia. Uh, but their policy has sort of switched backwards and forwards. You can see that not only is English introduced as a subject, but also uh, an attempt was made to introduce it as a medium for actually teaching maths and science. But this arose, uh, that so much resistance arose to this particular decision that it was rapidly cancelled by the government. Actually, I was involved in a project in trying to train these maths and science teachers and invested a lot of effort in doing that, only for the year, the next year, the policy to be cancelled and these people could go back to actually teaching maths and science uh, in uh, Bahasa Malay. And this is the Philippines, right? Which again is a, a somewhat different type of Asian country, and English has had a position in the primary school in the Philippines, I think, for a very long time. There's Hong Kong. I don't really need to tell you about Hong Kong. I did make an effort to sort of update this slide, um, and you can see that we've got an English language education, key learning area curriculum guide, and according to the web, this is a, in a draft version in 2017. 
And what I picked out from this particular document was uh, once one, one part of it that talked about strategies for development in Hong Kong, because of course English has had a, a role in elementary school for a long time. And also task-based language teaching has had a role in the elementary school in Hong Kong for a long time. So you can see that these are the strategies that wants to emphasize student-centered approach and adapting a task-based approach that further promotes experiential learning, et cetera. Yeah? I think this is the only policy document that specifically points towards task-based language teaching. I'm not going to answer these questions. Well, actually, I'm going to answer the second one in a minute, a little bit. But it seems to me that these are the two key questions that we need to think about. Do you think that it's a good idea to introduce the teaching of English in Asian primary schools? And if so, what do you think is the best way of teaching English uh, in Asian primary schools? Okay. These are the reasons that are usually given for introducing English into the primary schools in countries in Asia, right? And some of them are, 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 are very clearly very important. English obviously functions as a language of global communication. The desire to encourage students to develop awareness and understanding of a culture different to their own. Uh, Japan has coined the word internationalization and uses this word to really justify the teaching of English at primary school level. Parents are very keen on their children developing English throughout Asia, etc. So that becomes another powerful reason. And look at the fourth reason, because this is the one I'm going to talk a little bit about. The belief that foreign languages can be learned more easily by children than by adolescents or adults, right? This is a lay belief, and you hear it everywhere. To what extent is it justified? Well, it really rests on this particular critical period hypothesis. The critical period hypothesis states that if you start to learn a language beyond, uh, before a certain age, usually the age is puberty, although there's some argument about what the, age, what the actual age is, but if you start before that particular age, then it's easier to learn there's a better chance that you're actually going to achieve something close to native speaker proficiency, et cetera, right? And that's the psycholinguistic justification that is given for starting to learn a language young. This is one of the reasons that's often given. But the ultimate benefits of starting young only become evident in contexts where the learners have plentiful exposure to the second language. In other words, if you look at the research, the research does not actually lend very convincing support for the notion that if you introduce English into the primary school in China or Korea or Japan, that this will give the benefits that the critical period promises. Because the benefits only arise if there is very substantial exposure to the language. Without that substantial exposure to the language, there's no clear evidence that starting in primary school will result in higher levels of proficiency by the time that you end secondary school than if you just began in secondary school. And this is really by far the best study that's ever been carried out to investigate the advantages of starting in primary school, the Barcelona Age Factor Project. And you can see what the main findings are here. The older learners, these are the ones that started in secondary school, actually progress faster than the younger learners. And there's plenty of evidence to say that in the early period of learning a language, older learners learn more rapidly than young learners, right? Young learners may eventually overtake them, but only if they have very substantial exposure to the language. Without that substantial exposure to the language, you're not going to get the advantage for the young learners. So starting early, is there an advantage? Okay. And the answer is 
probably, probably, in terms of countries like Asia and in terms of countries like Korea, Japan, China, etc., probably, unless unless you have teachers who are going to provide this massive amount of exposure to learners, probably in most schools, starting early is not necessarily going to lead to an advantage. But this takes me to task-based language teaching because um, it does seem to me that if we are going to introduce, well, no, it's not an if, it's not an if, it's being introduced in all these countries, Vietnam as well, for example, which I haven't put up there, yeah? Uh, if we are going to teach English in primary schools, the crucial question becomes, what kind of approach should we adopt? And this is where I want to argue that task-based language teaching is the approach that we should adopt. Just very quickly, a few things about task-based language teaching. First of all, if you are going to do task-based language teaching, it's crucial that you have a clear concept of what a task is. And so I have offered in some of my publications this definition of a task. A task is a language teaching activity that has these four characteristics. This is an example of the task. You can read it for yourself. It's a very, very simple task involving pictures. It does meet those four criteria that I have just mentioned. This is another example of the task. And I'm tempted to play this because it's Friday and maybe we should have a little bit of fun, right, before the end. This is a number game and then the game goes on, the task goes on um, once you have learned to play the game. So would you like to play the game? All right, the game is very simple. It's a number game and the idea is to play between two people and you have to be the person who says the number 20. And you work upwards from one. And you can either say two numbers or just one number. So, for example, if I start off and say one, you could say two or you could say two, three. And if you said two, three, I could say four or four, five. Okay? All right? So who would like to play? Remember, the goal is to be able to say the number 20, and I must warn you, I know how to win. <laughs> okay? I know how to win. So who would like to play? Professor Bhatia. <laughs> would you like to start, or shall I start? I'll start. Okay. No, you have to, you build up, you build up. You, you, this is a listening activity. You obviously did not listen carefully enough. Okay, one. Two, three. Four. Five. Seven. No. Six, seven. <laughs> Six, seven. Eight. Nine, ten. Eleven. Twelve, thirteen. Fourteen. Fifteen, sixteen. Seventeen. 18, 19, 20. 20. <laughs> All right. You didn't say I can't say three numbers. <laughs> okay. Task-based language teaching should be fun, and that's why I very quickly played this game. But the actual activity is quite a serious one. It's an integrated skill one. It involves listening to the instructions about how to play the game. Some people listen carefully. All right. Yeah, and then it asks them to imagine you're writing a book, so when they've learned to play the game, they have to write out how to play the game for the children's book itself. They have to compare their interests with another student, etc. Okay? I'm going to have to go through this very quickly. Uh, I'm, there are so many misunderstandings about task-based language teaching. That to try to deal with these misunderstandings about task-based language teaching, I formulated a set of principles. And these are, and the next slide, are the principles that I formulated. 
It needs to be used as a tool by both the teacher and the learners to achieve the outcome of the task. Tasks can be input-based or production-based. Tasks do not necessarily involve speaking all the time. Some tasks can involve listening or reading. Many tasks are integrated skills. Input-based tasks do not require group work. The idea that to do task-based language teaching, you have to put students into pairs or groups is fundamentally mistaken about task-based language teaching. Input-based tasks are done with the teacher and the whole class. Input-based tasks can still lead to interaction. The idea of an input-based task is it does, not, it does not prevent speaking. It does not require speaking, okay? But very often, when you're doing input-based tasks with students, the students will speak. Sometimes not in English. Sometimes in their L1. I went too fast. Um, there's no presentation of language. The whole idea of task-based language teaching is you do not present language. There's no attempt to pre-identify the language that you want students to learn. Whatever they learn will come out of doing the tasks. When an opportunity arises, teachers can direct learners' attention to form. They often do this through corrective feedback. Learners can use their L1. Very important. This, of course, flies in the face of the South Korean Ministry of Education policy. Learners should be encouraged to risk take on completion of a task. The learners need to receive feedback on whether they were successful in achieving it. And tasks with young children can usefully be repeated. I had one PhD student, Natsuko Shintani, who was teaching six-year-old Japanese students she repeated the same task nine times. The children never got fed up with doing the tasks, okay? I'm going to skip this. One of the real problems in task-based language teaching is trying to choose tasks that are suitable for the level of the students that you're teaching. It remains one of the fundamental problems in trying to put together task-based services. And all I'm doing here is trying to indicate the characteristics of tasks that are easier or more difficult. And I'm doing the same here, picture bingo, it can be done in an easy way, it can be done in a more difficult way. Or well, guess who? Another typical primary school uh, task, it can be done in an easy way or a difficult way, right? So you can have exactly the same task materials, but how the task is actually carried out, how it's implemented, is going to affect the level of difficulty. Okay? Same point. So we arrive at three other questions, now about task-based language teaching. What is your own opinion about using TPLT in primary school classrooms? Do you think this is a good idea or not? What do you see as the main problems facing the introduction, the introduction of TPLT in Asian primary schools? And what needs to be uh, done to try to overcome these problems? So I'm going to deal very quickly with problems with implementing TPLT. And these now have been very clearly articulated, not least in Hong Kong, by the work of Carles, who carried out an evaluation of the introduction of task-based language teaching into elementary schools in Hong Kong. But you, the problems that he identified have also been identified in other countries as well, in Japan, in Korea, etc. There are really three types of problems. Problems involving teachers, involving students, and structural issues to do with uh, the nature of a particular educational system. These are the problems involving teachers. The teachers lack the proficiency in English or lack of confidence in their proficiency to conduct lessons in English. I'm not sure whether this is a problem in Hong Kong, but it becomes a major problem in Japan and 
to a certain extent also in China as well. Okay. Um, one of the points that I often make though is one of the advantages of task-based language teaching is that it's not only the students who improve their English, it's the teachers who improve their English because they're having to use English. There's a cultural mismatch between TBLT and the Asian culture of learning. You hear this again and again. Is it true? Well, in a minute you'll see that this has also been questioned, whether in fact it is true. Teachers are unclear about what constitutes a task. Yes, this is what Carles found in Hong Kong when he went to watch teachers doing task-based language teaching and he asked them, could you just tell me what a task is? They got very vague definitions of a task. And this has been, this kind of thing has been repeated in China and elsewhere. Uh, teachers experience problems in managing task-based lessons, especially when the students work in groups. This was another problem that Carlos found. Um, headmasters would come complaining to the English teacher that their classes were too noisy, etc. Problems have arisen in intercultural team teaching in countries such as Japan, which, which employ native speaking English teachers to work alongside local teachers as assistants. It's quite difficult to work out the relevant roles in this kind of team teaching context, especially with task-based language teaching. Problems involving students, that's the main problem. Actually, it's not just a problem for the students, it's also a problem for the teachers, right? There's two ways of looking at language. You can look at language as a tool for doing something, for creating some kind of outcome, communicative outcome, or you can look at language as a set of objects. These objects may be grammar, they may be lexis, they may be discourse features, whatever, okay? And task-based language teaching requires the participants to treat language as a tool and not to treat it as a set of objects, right? But what happens in most approaches to language teaching is that language is actually treated as an object. TBLT is not appropriate for beginner level learners. When faced with communication problems they cannot solve in English, learners will resort to their L1. But arguably that's not a problem. That's not a problem. If they solve the problem of trying to say something by using their L1, providing that they eventually hear how to do it in English, it's not actually a problem. If students focus only on achieving the outcome of the task, they may fail to exploit their full L2 resources. If the students are simply trying to achieve the outcome of their task, they might just use very pigeonized English. This is another argument that's been put forward. The structural issues are perhaps the ones that are most difficult to deal with, that teachers in many of these countries are still required to operate with the structural syllabus, a list of grammar structures, a list of lexical items, that learners ought to learn by a certain stage uh, uh, in education. Um, this is certainly true in Japan, which makes noises about using tasks, encouraging oral communication, etc., but still actually has a structural syllabus. Many Asian countries have mandated the use of TBLT, but the examinations continue to be of the traditional kind. And obviously, if the examinations are of the traditional kind, then teachers will teach in the examination. And that will make it very difficult to actually practice task-based language teaching. I ran across this problem in China, where I was involved in a, a project in a junior high school in this particular case. And they were introducing task-based language teaching. And it all went very well up to a particular point where the students, I think in their third year, had to take an official examination. And then the teachers simply abandoned it entirely and went back to traditional language teaching. So this leads me to the importance of teacher education. I don't see very much hope in task-based language teaching being introduced effectively into many contexts in Asia, unless there is also a very clear, well-worked-out policy 
for teacher education. And what tends to happen in Asia is that major changes in educational policy are mandated top down. And very little is done to think about what you need to actually ensure that those policies are actually implemented. And I think that this is this leads us in particular to teacher education. So what I've done recently is to look to see whether I could find any studies that reported evaluation of teacher education programs for task-based language teaching. And the first thing that I discovered is there's actually very few. There's very few studies that actually report what happens when you uh, engage in a teacher preparation course for task-based language teaching, to what extent the actual course is successful. I don't have time or chance to tell you uh, what these particular studies did. What I'm going to do instead is to try to uh, extract the factors that seem to be the crucial factors, the important factors for ensuring that a task-based language preparation program has a reasonable chance of success. So uh, my idea is that if we identify these factors, then this perhaps will help us to put together effective programs. And I'm going to talk about three sets of factors very, very quickly. Factors relating to the content of teacher preparation programs, those relating to the methodology, not the methodology of task-based language teaching, the methodology of the teacher preparation courses, and factors relating to teachers' uptake of TBLT in their classroom. Do teachers, what, what will ensure that teachers will actually make the attempt to use task-based language teaching in their classrooms? These are the content factors. Rather than read through it, I'll make you read it. Two is crucial, and I've already made this point, that unless teachers have a very clear understanding of what a task is, task-based language teaching cannot thrive. Three is also important. There's no sense having a teacher preparation program and then sending teachers back to the schools if they do not have actual an actual task-based syllabus and task-based materials that they can use. Five remains the problem, and I've already mentioned this, because this comes up again and again, that teachers constantly say, how do I know, how can I choose tasks that are suitable for my particular students, at the right level for my students? The importance of input-based tasks, I've already emphasized this. If you have beginner-level learners, it's futile trying to get them to do speaking tasks because they don't have the proficiency to do the speaking. But you can do input-based tasks because you can present the input in a way that can help them comprehend the input. So they will learn the language from the input and later move on to speaking tasks. And also, any teacher preparation program must address the kinds of problems that I've already articulated relating to the teachers, the students, and also the structural issues. These are training methodology, fa methodology factors. The first one is the key, that if you want to encourage students to do task-based language teaching methodology, then the actual methodology of your teacher preparation program must be task-based, okay? Not lecture-based, which is what I'm doing at the moment, okay? <laughs> task-based. And teachers should be required to design their own tasks and, if possible, to also evaluate them by teaching them. Teachers must be engaged in the act of actually designing, constructing, and ideally trying to teach and evaluate their own tasks. These are teacher uptake factors. Uptake refers to 
whether the teachers, when they go back to their classrooms, are actually going to try to do task-based language teaching. Where possible, training should be school-based rather than in a training institution, although this is not going to be possible in any situations. Teachers will need to support, need the support of school-based mentors who are well-versed in the principles and practice of TBLT. This is a major problem. You might train, you might have a, uh, 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 you might have a course that trains uh, elementary school teachers to do task-based language teaching. They go off to do their teaching practice in a school, and nobody in the school is doing task-based language teaching. Do you seriously think that these young teacher trainees are actually going to go against the established teachers and try to do something very different? So there has to be a problem. There has to be also a policy of developing mentors inside the actual schools. Six, above all, if task-based language teaching is going to work, teachers need support for the sustained effort that is required to implement TBLT successfully. The one place that this has happened and is now well documented is the introduction of TBLT in elementary schools and high schools in Flanders in Belgium. And the key person there is Van Gay Brandon, and he has written extensively about the introduction of TBLT into schools, elementary and high schools in Flanders. And he's pointed out what, in his opinion, made the introduction successful. And indeed, his particular program covers many of these points that I'm raising here. Some conclusions. How am I doing for time? Five minutes. I'm doing pretty well. Um, I think the first thing is the need for research. And I'm not asking for more research on task-based language teaching because there's a growing and a lot of work on task-based language teaching, a lot of research, right? What, what there isn't is research that is investigating the training of teachers to do task-based language teaching to find out whether, in fact, the training is effective or not effective, right? And then building on that experience in order to develop more effective programs for introducing task-based language teaching. And it seems to me that it needs to look at those issues, the extent to which starting English in the primary school results in enhanced proficiency, and um, where different learning outcomes are evident in different samples of young learners, what factors are responsible for them, right? Uh, it seems to me, strong words, it seems to me very irresponsible for ministries of education to introduce the teaching of English through task-based language teaching or any other way into the elementary school and not to evaluate whether that introduction is successful, is effective. Right? In other words, we need many more studies like the Barcelona study. And if English is introduced, it's essential this is achieved, is achieved uh, using a teaching approach that is suitable for young children. The last thing we want is more standard grammar teaching going on in the primary schools. And that's why I have emphasized task-based language teaching as the way that is appropriate for, uh, um, for the elementary school. And by the way, I'm not a purist with regard to task-based language teaching. Maybe I was, but I changed a bit. I now recognize that there is a need for more traditional approaches to language teaching, but not at the early stages of language learning. The early stages of language learning should be experiential, should be task-based. Later, there may be a need for more traditional types of language teaching. That can happen when students get to the secondary school. So the way forward, Littlewood has argued that learning should be inducted into performing tasks 
values and activities that lead from the traditional form-focused exercises through activities of an increasingly communicative nature. What he is basically arguing for is um, traditional language teaching in the form of present presentation, practice, production, PPP, right? But, and he argues that because he suggests that in the Asian context, it's not feasible to introduce task-based language teaching because it runs against the whole culture of learning in Asian countries. But uh, interestingly, a fairly recent article by Lei, who I think is in Council Hong Kong, said, disagreeing with, disagreeing with little, that essential statements about cultural inappropriateness of TPLT in the Asian context need to be put under scrutiny. And indeed, she did that in her article, and, including, and, it, and concluded that many of the, the, the cultural reasons given for not doing task-based language teaching in Asian countries was not justified, because it's based on all the problems that task-based language teaching experiences when it's introduced. But Lei went on to point out that the problems that Littlewood pointed out for Asia also exist in Europe. They also existed in Flanders. The issue isn't that there are problems and therefore it's unsuitable for Asian country. The issue is how do we deal with the problems? And in Flanders, they found ways of dealing with the problems. And Right at the end, I'm not going to talk about this, this will be another talk sometime. The current position that I'm really arguing for is a modular curriculum. And my idea of a modular curriculum is a program that begins with task-based language teaching for beginners, takes them up to the point where they have confidence in understanding and using the language, and then proceeds to introduce a more traditional formal type of approach. And that completes my talk, but I would like to see if anyone can beat me in my number game. <laughs> so who would, no, 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 don't clap yet. All right, unless you want to go home. Who wants to play the number game? Okay, yeah, please, you. Would you stand up? Okay, I mean, yeah. Uh, we have, I recognize you now. I thought I recognized you. Uh, I didn't, yeah. Would you like to play? Have you played it with me before? No, I haven't. <laughs> I bet you haven't been listening to the talk. I bet you've been working out how to win the game, haven't you? <laughs> okay. okay. Would you like me to start or you? Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, five, ten, eleven, twelve, uh, thirteen, fourteen, six, six, seventeen. <laughs> well, you know that if I say 17, your time is up. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Alex, for the very interesting and inspiring talk. I guess we have time for a couple of questions from Wait, I think it, the microphone's coming. You are impressed with what you said about language as a tool. All language is object, right? To to have to choose. Now, if we treat language as a tool and we introduce task based uh, language teaching, um, and we are satisfied with what the primary school students are able to achieve, they are able to carry out the task, right? They might need a lot of grammatical errors. And yet, when it comes to the exam, so Asian parents are very particular about what they get and they really choose in the exam. So they can perform a lot of tasks, and they are a lot of Different tasks, mm -hmm. but they are not able to look on grammatical accuracy, for example, pronunciation accuracy. So, 
how can they possibly do well in exams and how do we convince parents that you know, well, task based language teaching is the appropriate approach to use? Okay, one of the reasons I'm interested in the primary school is because the idea of exams is often less important in the primary school. Okay? And therefore, there is more opportunity for, uh, there's more flexibility in terms of how one's going to try to teach these children a language, etc. Right? Um, it is possible to try to get learners to use language accurately uh, from a fairly early stage if you teach them rules and you get them to practice the rules, right? But what we know is that they may be able to use those rules to get answers right in the examination, but they can't communicate and they can't use those rules when they're actually communicating. And you're nodding and many other people are nodding, right? We all know a situation where students have undergone um, learning English for many, many years and can do tests but can't communicate hardly at all, right? And this seems to me a complete waste of everybody's time because what we should be doing is trying to ensure that students can actually um, use whatever they do know in communication, for communication, yeah? Um, and I don't think accuracy should even be the major factor. So one of the problems in Asia is the insistence that examinations continue to measure accuracy, right? Now, how long is it going to take policymakers in Ministry of Education to work out the contradiction between wanting to develop oral communication and confidence in their students, yeah? the contradiction between that and the insistence that there are still traditional grammar-based examinations, et cetera, right? There's a contradiction there, and that contradiction has to be faced up to. So I don't know. I mean, it seems to me that ultimately, the people that advise the Ministry of Education must con constantly draw their attention to this. I mean, what do we... <laughs> there are two ways of learning a language. And probably many of you who have learned English have started off with accuracy and eventually added some kind of fluency, right? But that's probably how most of you learned English, yeah? That you began by focusing on accuracy, but you couldn't really communicate, and then gradually, as a result of various language learning experiences, you actually learn to be able to communicate, right? So what we have is an accuracy first, and a fluency later, maybe, maybe, because you are all successful language learners, but there are millions out there, right? who have gone through an accuracy-first approach and have never achieved fluency. There are millions in China, Japan. This is the norm, right? Now, we're wasting their time. We're putting them through years of studying English at school, yeah, so that they can do tests, but never actually learning to be able to use English to communicate. So what I am proposing is a reversal, not accuracy first, fluency later, but fluency first and accuracy later. And that is what I meant by my modular curriculum. We start with task-based language teaching, which is an approach to language teaching that emphasizes the development of fluency, broadly defined, yeah? And then later on, we start to get learners to pay more attention to accurate language use. But fluency must surely come first. Sorry, long answer. Maybe <laughs> one more question. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm from Japan and I'm very feel sorry about uh, Japanese education system after you're <laughs> 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 
because the year 2020 is the year that we start teaching English as an artificial subject. And am I right in understanding or thinking that it's too late because there are not so many uh, professions, English teachers in primary schools. So it is, it, uh, am I right in uh, thinking that it takes a long time or does it take a very long, long time or is it progress to do that? Well, you could argue that there aren't many fluent, proficient teachers of English in the high schools either in Japan. You know that. Right? I mean, there are increasing in the high schools teachers who are reasonably fluent in English, right? But there are many who still aren't, right? You're absolutely right that introducing English in the primary school in Japan is very problematic because students, because the teachers lack all proficiency in English, right? And that will unfortunately drive them to adopting an object-based approach to the teaching of language, right? where they use Japanese to teach them grammar rules or to teach them the meanings of words, etc. Right? That's the fallback position. If you don't have confidence and proficiency in using the language, then it's much safer and easier to teach language as an object, right? Yeah? And that's the danger. That's that's where you're wasting time. You're wasting the student's time. You're wasting the teacher's time, right? So I don't know. It means, as I said, that if you're going to introduce English into the primary school, you can't just make a top-down decision to do that without having a fully worked out implementation policy, which probably is going to involve many years and takes me back to teacher preparation, right? Now, in Japan, tell me, is there a properly worked out implementation policy for 2020 when English becomes a mandatory subject in the primary schools? Tell me. And if I'm giving Japan a hard time and you tell me there is a properly worked out policy for being able to implement this, this, this top-down policy regarding the introduction of English into the primary schools, I will apologize about everything I've said to Japan about Japan. <laughs> but it's not just Japan's problem. It's a problem in China or in Korea. But I think in many ways China and Korea is doing much more to try to actually train primary school teachers to, uh, uh, to use task-based task type approaches in, in the elementary school. Are there, for example, um, uh, are there uh, programs for uh, uh, teacher education uh, for foreign languages, for English, that have been introduced into the universities so that teachers can, uh, uh, students can take these courses and then get jobs in primary school? So, is there a policy? Hang on. Where's the, can you give it a, so it's still our uh, job to create, it's still in the beginning, so the teachers, the, especially the teachers trying to be primary school teachers needs to know and learn what to teach, yes, but currently they do not, uh, they are not required to learn those things, so that's why we have a problem. In yeah, proficiency sense. Yeah, so the answer is a need for an implementation policy. Uh, it's the implementation policy. That's it. That is a way of preparing teachers to be able to teach English in an appropriate way in the elementary school, right? And that's what I. That's what worries me that the countries take decisions to introduce English in the primary school without an implementation policy. Right? And we end up with the Barcelona thing, that these children will go through learning English for three, four, five years, whenever it starts in the elementary school, and they will be no better at the end of secondary school than if they've started at secondary school. That is probably what is going to happen. Thank you. 
So, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, let's just put our hands together to thank you so much. And now, uh, I would like to invite uh, Professor Hans Lovka.